Hi there, and welcome to How To with Ann Malum. When deciding to do this podcast, I really wanted to create something that could give people real tools on how to execute on certain things. So often we talk about things on such a macro scale that yes, leaves people inspired, but with no real idea on what the steps are to make something in their own life happen. I challenge and encourage and probe my amazing guests to get granular and specific on their strategies, their mindset, their tactics, and their methodology so that you can learn practical, actionable steps to best optimize your competence, career, health, and wealth. What's up, everybody? Welcome to How To with Ann Malum. Today, we are really fortunate to have Nikki Sharp with us today. And Nikki's how to is how to overcome disordered eating, something many of us have had issues with either currently or in our past. Nikki is a two times best selling author, creator of a number one detox app, and can be seen giving advice on television shows nationwide. She is a transformation coach who helps women overcome their biggest fears in life in order to fall in love with themselves and see drastic changes in all areas. Amazing, Nikki. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. Thrilled to be here and talking about one of my favorite subjects because so many people deal with this. And actually, I want to just jump straight in. I have a a good friend, a nutritionist, a, a quite famous nutritionist friend in the UK, and she was being interviewed by a magazine. And the the interviewer had said, you know, something like 14% of people in the UK have e- uh, disordered eating or problems. And my friend stopped her and said, may I correct you? And the woman said, sure, please do. And she said, only 3% of people have an actual eating disorder, but 97% of people have some form of disordered eating. And that's a pretty big statistic when you think about it of what is disordered eating. It's obsession about food, how you look, your body, what I can, what I can't eat, fear. And so this is a topic that I am highly, highly passionate about. Yeah, well, I we're just so listeners know right off the bat, this is going to get super vulnerable, at least for for me, because I think it's the best way for people not to feel alone. Some of the thoughts we have, we convince ourselves we're the only person who thinks that way or does this thing. I know, you know, Jamie Hess and I uh, had her on the podcast a couple of weeks ago and, you know, she was so brave and talking about like not telling her husband for seven years that she was throwing up her food and he knew everything about her besides that. And she kept that deep, dark secret, you know, and now has to lock the freezer when he's away. And it's like, listen, you know, some of these things might sound dramatic to other people, but we have to know what our our triggers are, where we where we mess up. I when I go back home to Bismarck, North Dakota, where I grew up and I'm in my mom's house, I still get triggered by like, oh, this is the toilet I threw up in for for so many years. And I can easily put myself back into those girl that girl's shoes. Yeah, I mean, and that's something I I definitely look forward to talking about as well. I'm very open with my journey in hopes of helping someone else because when I was going through what I did, which was two eating disorders, body dysmorphia, I mean, it really turned into three because of just the the need for control and and changing things, trying every diet under the sun and and learning my triggers and all of that. And I think it's so important, exactly as you said, to know where or when you might get triggered just as Jamie when her husband leaves or you like Mm -hmm. I mean I don't know a single person that doesn't go home and get triggered by something whether it's a conversation or the food there and and I even remember for years I would go home and my mom always had you know peanut butter and jelly in the pantry and of course that was like a totally off-limits food for me you Mm -hmm. know whatever ingredients and so what did I do by telling myself, well, you can't have it. I would then binge on it and then totally. feel awful. And so that was a whole journey too. I mean, luckily now I can go there and I'm like, oh, I, I think I've binged enough times on it that I don't want it. But, you know, to any varying degree, and that's why I started with that statistic of whether you're in the full blown eating disorder, which we both mm-hmm. have experienced, or someone is just going through a food obsession or feeling triggered, emotional eating, there's room for growth and improvement. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. Well, yeah. And I'm I'm really thrilled to finally be sitting here. And I feel like I can honestly say I don't have any problems with food anymore. Um, I still have some issues 
with my body and acceptance and acceptance by by men. Um, but I have learned also the same thing you did, which was when I created those rules for myself of like, I can't have this. Well, shit, that's when I would like go to the store, buy a, you know, a, a gallon of ice cream with candy and whatever. And like, I, I, I created this habit where I ended up doing this several times a week, Nikki. Like I went into credit card debt because I was throwing up my food. Like it's, it's kind of nuts. Um, and I would look in the mirror each morning. I was in my mid twenties when this was going on. And I'm like, what are you doing? Like, like, look at your life. And I would shame myself in the mirror every morning, tell myself that was it. I'm never doing this again. And then, you know, two nights go by and I'm right back in that spot again. So learning for me that being completely like this is off limits doesn't doesn't help me. Some people can operate that way and like I just can't touch this and if I don't I'm fine. For me it just frankly makes me want to get away with it. Makes me want it more. <laughs> and so I lie yeah. about it and it becomes a big secret. Yeah. Been there done that. I I remember doing my taxes years ago and before I would send it off and I started looking at all of the amount of money that I'd spent on food and alcohol in my binge states and I'm like what exactly it's that mindset what are you doing you're yeah. literally going into debt for this you're paying thousands upon thousands of dollars and you're unhappy and you don't like yourself and then the very stress of looking at my my bank account and my finances i would then go binge more spend more right. money until you learn the patterns on overcoming that and at least for me it was getting really vulnerable with myself and saying what do I actually not like? Like, what am I scared of? What am I fearful about going on? And only from there was I able to really start to move the needle because I'd been hiding away from all of the fears and numbing them and distracting them through food, alcohol, whatever it is, exercise, traveling. And once I, I mean, getting real and honest with yourself sucks, mm -hmm. right? It sucks. It's, it's scary but in doing that, there's freedom because at least now you're admitting to yourself. It's kind of like AA. Right? The first step is you have to admit that you have a problem. And that was like me, my inner self talk being like, OK, so we have a problem, Houston. Yeah. And it was like, what do you do from that? And so at least my journey, I didn't have access to therapists and doctor. Well, all the doctors really would just try to put me on antidepressant medication. And I'm like, that's not what I need help with, guys. Right. And therapy wasn't available. I didn't have insurance at the time. Acupuncture wasn't part of the, you know, health plans anyways. So all of these different modalities we have now, podcasts weren't really a thing back then. And so it, with my journey, it was years and years and years of suffering, which is what led me down the journey of just learning myself mm -hmm. and the tools that I teach now in order to help other people. So they, like everyone at some point in their life is going to suffer. It's just how long you choose to be in that suffering. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let's, let's give the listeners some context, Nikki. So let's share a little bit of your journey and story, you know, and anything along the way of when you were in it, you know, did you know why you were in it? Could you figure out how you got to that place? And then of course, you know, what were the steps in the moments where you're just like, I can't, I can't live like this anymore. Sure. So I grew up at around like 11. I started seeing, I was always a, a kind of tall, skinny child, like way taller than all the boys growing up, very skinny. And I have just like, I, I want to say since coming out of my mother's womb, like I've loved fashion. I just, I do. And I would look at the covers and, you know, it was like Kate Moss back in the day and that heroin chic and and Giselle and all of these amazing models. And I'm like, I want to be that. I want to be on that cover. And and it it looked, I love beautiful things too. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm not saying a, a physicality, but like, I like flowers and, you know, just like nice sure. aesthetics. And through this, it was kind of a mix of that, wanting to go into fashion to being as a skinny child, which then turned into skinny fat because I went to school and my body's changing. So I was still skinny, but I wasn't working out. So now I just, I'm like flabby in weird places, but also skinny. So didn't feel great about my body. And my dad, the connection, I learned this later, but the connection point between him and me as a child, you're always seeking to have connection with your parents. So yeah. he would, he would go and try all these different diets, even though he was a, a very 
thin man. Like when I say thin, just fit, like physically active. But he's like, oh, this, I remember the first diet I tried, it's the South Beach diet. And we did it together. So there's that common bond. I was like 13 at the time. And then we went to like Weight Watchers. And now that I look back, I'm like, why was my dad on this? Like he was, he didn't need it. So that was like his own stuff and my trying to be connected with him. And so, you know, add on these different models of the world. I then go into modeling. Well, for no, before I did that, I, I went to LA. I did an exchange program for a year during college from Colorado. And I get there and I looked at, I was applying to agencies out there and I looked at a photo of myself on the beach. Yeah, I was like skinny fat, but like not even really skinny at that point. Like I was just, I was like what you would kind of just say, like you look good, right? Sure. Which is yeah. a trigger word for a lot of women. Oh, you look good. It's mm -hmm. Like you look healthy. So I looked quote unquote healthy, which in the modeling world doesn't right. work. Right, right. Literally something snapped overnight because I was in a new place, new people. It was scary. And I literally just kind of stopped eating. Like I would do oh my goodness, a, a one egg omelet with a slice of American cheese and that was breakfast. And then I would do lunch, which was iceberg lettuce with like three croutons and like a drizzle of ranch. That was lunch. And I don't know the specific calories. I just know it was very little. Yeah. And and then I would repeat the egg. So it was like very little carbs, very little just anything, not good food. And that's so funny, Nikki, because that's what the egg whites were my thing, too. I would make egg whites, put Splenda on them of all things. Oh and then I would make yeah. three more egg whites and I would take them to work with me. Wow. And so for me, like I did the full egg, but it was like just one. Not two, yeah. Just one. Yeah. And the the big thing I, I well, then what I started doing is making green tea because I had night classes and I would put, you know, skim milk in it and then like six Splendas or some ridiculous thing where you're like, uh, and that was to curb my hunger. Mm -hmm. And then I would go for these hour long runs in the morning. I had swim class. So within months, I remember I went back for Halloween to Colorado and people looked at me and they're like, are you okay? But I was so happy and proud and I thought I looked good. Mm -hmm. And from there, it just, it definitely became this obsessive thing because then I couldn't sleep. So then I I went to the, you know, doctor at school and they put, they gave me Ambien because I'm like, I haven't slept in months. So they gave me right. that. So now I'm relying on Ambien, which was a six year addiction of Ambien. Mm. And after I left, I went back to Colorado and this was always interesting. I would go back to Colorado and the weight would come back. I'd feel happy. Mm. And then I would go somewhere else. And so I graduated university literally a week later. I was on a plane going to Shanghai feeling good about myself and then again that little trigger that switch and it was like oh you're you're not like skinny enough in my mind and mm -hmm. so immediately you know stop eating so Shanghai was even worse where I would because I didn't trust the food and cooking and we had like cockroaches in our apartment yeah. it was in the kitchen so I'd eat like one teeny tiny little yogurt a strawberry yogurt in the morning we would be on castings I would have a bag of peanuts so like talk about just like the and like really oily salty peanuts like diet cokes all day long mm -hmm. and then for dinner like i would eat like a giant carrot like i would just like nibble on it like so not great when you think about like <laughs> yeah there's what, some work there <laughs> yeah a little bit and then i went back to colorado after that and again put the weight back on was joyful happy didn't even think about my body at that point I then moved to Australia and once again, look at myself and I'm like, yeah, I don't like how I look. And so the modeling was kind of always the trigger point for me because I'm now comparing myself to other people mm -hmm. and I'm taking myself out of where I was joyful, where I was happy, where I was around other people. And then I, this was the first time though that I learned at least, I say this, at least a healthier version of losing weight. So I did a six week detox and it was a really strict one of a you know quarter of a cup of oatmeal in the morning with water. I think that was it. But and cinnamon. So at least we're, you know, making improvements. And then it was mm -hmm. a Greek yogurt. And so the the nutrition side of that, and like I would have vegetables and egg white omelets at that point. So I I definitely learned more about not just starving myself. Like so it was very a calorie deficient diet still but at least healthier right and I, some vegetables some fruits yeah. yeah yeah 
And what I found on that was that I I started binging on almonds, like handfuls of almonds at once, which is just like pure fat. And it, and your body eventually is like, oh, I can't do this. So I would try and throw it up. Luckily for me, that was never a thing. I'm glad, like, I'm so glad it wasn't because I know that I could have become mm-hmm. obsessive about it. And from there, I... As soon as I came off the detox, I was like, oh, I feel so good. Once again, that like I love my body, feel confident. And then my dad came to visit. And well, first my mom came to visit and I told her that I had an eating disorder. And that was the hardest thing that one of the hardest things that I'd ever done. And she was so compassionate. And she's like, I know. I'm like, Mm. oh, how how did you know? Right. Like in your mind, you're like, how did how did you know? I thought I was so secretive about that. And she went on to blame herself, didn't really give me a lot of support on that. Neither of my parents did. You know, it is what it is. This is my journey, not theirs. And But it wasn't, they weren't like the, okay, well, how do we help you? Like, how do we support you sort of thing? She just went on to blame herself. So she went on her own Mm -hmm. path on that. So then my dad, a few months later, comes to visit and he ended up writing me a letter afterwards or an email and he said and and it's now that i look back it's true but he said it was like being with dr jekyll and mr hyde where he didn't know which version of me he was gonna get the like fun playful you know normal nikki or the obsessive thinking about food hiding binging stealing their candy because his his wife had come out and uh, my parents were divorced at the time and she's great. She could just like have a bite of a candy and put it back. And so I would just like go and steal them and eat them all. And, you know, for anyone listening firsthand, like when you're binging, you're not in a super happy mood to other people. You kind of mm-hmm. take your own resentment on yourself and project it onto others. So that's what he meant by the Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. And while I appreciate now <laughs> that email, it once again, wasn't a supportive thing. It wasn't a, hey, I see something wrong. How can I, you know, as your father, how can I show up for you? It was just like, hey, I want to call you out on this and show you. Like, yeah. All right. So that really left me feeling quite alone in this journey. And like, I couldn't go to them or tell them or talk to them about things. So when I would talk to them, it was like, no, things are great. Yeah, I'm traveling. Woo. So from there, I then went to... Um, I was 22, 21 at the time, which is like getting old for a model. And it's such a messed up industry. And I was like, this is the last chance that I have to go do this internationally just to explore the world. So I decide to do that. I go to South Korea, to Seoul, and I go from being, you know, feeling okay in in Australia to get in there. And I just wasn't getting jobs. I don't know if, you know, they were placing me wrong, but here I am like the all American girl, only I'm a little too skinny, but Korea, they really, they really like you skinny, but I wasn't quite tall enough. And so I remember going into my agency one day and they tell me, so we'd like you to gain weight here, but not here. So like they want, they wanted me to gain weight, like actually on my thigh, my lower thigh by the knee, but not on my upper thigh. Right? They they wanted me to gain weight in like specific places. And they were so sweet about it. It's not like this was done with a malice or bad intention. It's just they were saying, can you gain weight? But like also, I guess now that I know what I know, it's like, well, I, you know, train differently, whatever. So that set me off on, oh, they want me to gain weight so I can go eat now. So then the binging really started at that point because I felt like I had kind of free reign. So then I get to, so it was like I'd binge and then starve myself, binge and then starve myself. And then I went to Bangkok after that. And that one was so interesting because they would, there were girls from all over the world and they would measure literally everywhere. Like they'd measure your neck, your waist, your thighs, like upper, lower thigh, like you name it. And girls who gained weight two weeks in a row like even if it was like two or three pounds they would send home so Mm -hmm. it's like a lot of pressure and for me there at least I was eating a bit more healthy in a sense like when I say healthy like I was 
cooking stir fries and adding vegetables and things of that nature. And I was going out and I was having fun. So I look back on Bangkok and like that was a really fun time for me. So the eating disorder didn't feel as prevalent because I had other things to focus on. And by the by, Nikki, did you figure out at this point was again your the disordered eating uh, at this point driven by acceptance like you were trying to accept yourself or was it mainly other people you know you desperately whether the, the modeling industry feeling rejected like do you know where it really came from for you at this at this time no at this time not at all because everyone is is supposed to be stupid thin like just everyone and everyone is so it's you're comparing yourself to everyone else and it, i was not as tall as a lot of the other models and so then you're trying to compensate and feel unique. So, but I had no idea why I was doing any of this other than I felt better when my body was thinner. I felt more in control, especially in a, an industry where I have no idea if I'm going to get hired or not. Yeah, there's this weird, I mean, listen, I remember that too. Like I'm, I remember walking around the streets of Philadelphia, which is where I lived when mine was at its height. And I would like watch people indulging in meals and i'm like you're i would like say to myself like oh, you people are so weak you know i'm like you can't like you don't have the willpower you know you're not disciplined in the way that i am like i would get like get this weird high mm. off of knowing that like i don't need what these other people need i don't need food like that interesting and yeah that's i never had that that's i can see i can see how that would come up though mm -hmm. for sure I have more of that now. Like now what I know, if I see people walking down the street eating a sandwich and just, you know, like rushing against traffic, that's, I wouldn't say the judgment, but that's more like, oh God, like just sit down and eat your meal. Like you don't need to rush in life and eat it. So it's, it's kind of changed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I think there is just some form of like, we always want to control ourselves, control other people, look down, look up. It, I think that's nature, but so the the long short of that, and, and I kind of went into detail there, is just as I went more west, so meaning then I went to London, then I went to New York. New York was the crucifix of like, I was binging and restricting every single day because there was a food shop, literally every other door. And you know this, living in there, like I I didn't know what to do. There was a bakery and this, I mean, so that's where things got really ugly for me in my mind because of the binging, the restricting. I was desperately unhappy when I lived in New York, like desperately. And the long short of that, end up leaving New York, kind of quit modeling at that point. I did like one other job later back in London, which wasn't anything, but that's really like where my modeling career came to an mm -hmm. end. And I was like, that's it. I'm done. I can't do this anymore. So I went home back to Colorado, did 30 days vowed to myself to exercise every day, not in a form of punishment, but in a form of like, hey, get outside, go for a bike ride or go for a hike. Do things with love, with joy and started cooking meals with my mom. And my mindset after 30 days completely shifted like night and day to the point of when I went there and I took a photo, I was like 2D in the mirror. And when I left, it's interesting because I it looked like I like when I look at the photos, it actually looks like I gained weight, which I probably needed to. But in my mind, I actually thought that I lost weight because mm -hmm. I now I look better, meaning I feel better. So my body looked more toned and tight. That's where I really I was practicing yoga often. And so then I went back to London and I, I started learning about nutrition. And that's when my light bulb moment just went off of, oh, my God, eat good food, feel good eat bad food, feel bad. And it's like, it's like, duh, obviously. But I needed to really realize that right. of if I had food in my fridge that was already prepared, ready to go when I'd come home and I was starving, I would eat that. If I didn't have that food prepared, I would go binge. And so it was like these little, little like clicks. And then London and a, you know, a few years later from all of this is where I, I really changed my mindset on I would not allow myself to exercise if I'd binged. And so I rewired my brain on saying, exercise is not a punishment. I love exercise. I love feeling mm -hmm. good about my body. And 
that was hard because I'd binge, feel like shit. And then I'm like, nope, nope, you're not going to the gym for an hour cardio session. And through the process of that, that was one of the hardest but best things I've ever done because I fell in love, I re fell in love with exercise in the sense of this is not meant to burn cal. Like I personally hate that term, burn calories, because it insinuates that it, for me, it was insinuating that I'd done something bad. Yeah, like punishment. Yeah, pun- and and I'm like, let's take that away. And so from there, you know, the journey keeps going a, a few years later. But th- that was kind of the main, the mainstay. And then I got into kind of the healthy eating side of it, and I wasn't quote unquote di- diagnosed or anything with it, but like orthorexia, where I then got obsessive about the healthy eating and oh my god. But the the problem was the more obsessive I got on the healthy eating, I would still go binge on the the crap. Mm-hmm. So it's all it was all all there and. <laughs> I yeah, know you, you know that well, this journey. Yeah, the food is so interesting because especially in America, you know, every and, and you know, my my brother in particular back in North Dakota, they 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 all think food is just meant to taste good. If it doesn't taste good, I don't want to eat. Why would you eat it? And so as soon as you train your taste buds on what tastes good, right? So if you're eating fast food, salt, sugar, all of these things, and then you try to eat just sort of real, whether it's plain vegetables, you know, um, unsalted things or whatever, your taste buds are like, ew, this, this isn't, why would you eat this? So it's 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 difficult or fascinating, again, the what we've done to food and how challenging, you know, it is in the U.S. and the environment that's that's here and all of the, I don't even, like, it's, it's option, temptation, convenience. All of those things are just obviously not great for us. But Nikki, you, you said it earlier, and uh, I'm fortunate to be on that path too. You have enough examples of when you eat bad food, you just end up feeling poorly. Like the 30 minutes of eating the thing that's horrible for you, you know, whether it's cheesesteak and then cake on top of that, it makes you tired. It makes you lethargic. It makes you uh bloated all of those things that you pay the price for it and you're just at some point like i i don't want to feel that way anymore but again you know the disordered eating for many of us is deeper it's emotional it stems from something and for me personally it stemmed a lot from like acceptance from men i witnessed and saw you know even comments that my father would make about other women and their bodies and comments that you just noticed that boys in middle school make and then and then in high school make and you realize normally the only time they're talking about women in a positive way is is how they look and so you're like oh if i want to be accepted by this population i need to adhere to this physical way of how what they find attractive and that really that really screws with you especially in an environment as you get older, and I saw men are the ones sitting in power, men are the one making a lot of decisions on, you know, hiring women, like they just had so much power. And it's like, geez, like, you don't get any access if you don't look a certain way. Um, and that's still one of the things that I feel like I can be um, triggered and challenged by in my intimate relationships. And you hear about all these men, you know, normally the ones stepping out of the relationship and you know, based off of physicalities or things like that. And you're like, huh, how is this going to happen? You know, is this going to happen to me if your body changes, if you grow and you look differently? Um, so those are still some of the things that I feel like I struggle and 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 work with. And like I said, everybody has their own version of why they end up having disordered eating, whether again, it's a this is the only thing I had control over. But I think honestly, for me, it was just about acceptance from men. And I and I hate that, but it's the mm-hmm. truth. And it's actually so interesting that you'd say that. Like I'd never until this moment really thought about that, I guess, because mine was always something mm-hmm. to, like I was always comparing myself to other women. Mm-hmm. And it's like when I got down into the nitty gritty and learning why these things happen and why I was in that, you know, controlling nature, it was was this fascinating thing and it's what I teach now that you have to be willing to look at your fears and the fear was and it's so like irrational but yet it's the fear that's in the subconscious mind that controls you so 
the fear was if I'm not, and I call it 2D, literally like just a paper, 2D thin, I wasn't, I was going to have to go get a, a normal job, meaning that I wasn't unique. So a normal nine to five job. And which is so funny because I'm like, there's nothing like in no way, shape or form do I think there's anything wrong with that. Like quite the opposite. I'm an entrepreneur and I'm like, yeah, there's times that I wish I was just in a normal nine to five job because it's it so much harder now. But at the at that time, it was like, OK, if I'm not 2D, that means that I'm not unique. And if I'm not unique, that means I have to get a, a normal job. And if I have a normal job, then I'm not going to be able to live this life that I want and travel and do these things. And if I can't do that, then I'm just going to be stuck at home, Colorado or wherever, living like everyone else. And therefore, what's the point of living? So I literally tied like, what's the point of living to how skinny I was through this this kind yeah. of like what then fears. And as I kind of unraveled that, it was like, all right, where, do, you know, where does this stem from? Where, where does that actually stem right. from? And it really stemmed from, and it's kind of the same thing. It's it's always a catch-22. Like the ego mind drives us, but it can also become our enemy. And so the same thing that drove me to have success, to you know write books, do everything that I'm doing now, be a public speaker, was really getting the approval from my parents. And it's like the more, so the other thing in my mind was, the more quote unquote famous that I would get, it's like, oh, my parents would actually like me more. They would acknowledge me more. And in reality, it kind of was the opposite that like the more that I was doing these things, it's like I got more out of, not out of touch with them, but like, they're like, oh, you're busy. You're doing that. So it, the distance became more. So the very thing I was seeking, their love and approval. Yeah. It, it was, it was this going further away. And then I realized that that's probably what had to do with, you know, being so thin is like, oh, like you're recognizing me or you're noticing me or, hey, I'm special. Look at me. Yeah. Attention. Yeah. I mean, this is why therapy is, is so amazing. I had those own, my own realizations with that stuff as well. And and Nikki, ironically, like I had the same thoughts around life as you did. I'm like, if I'm not ridiculously unique, special, attractive fit, like, like as high on every category, career interesting you know i went and i went around the world running marathons um again honest with myself just to make myself more interesting like it, it was like oh cool that would be an interesting thing for me to have to my life resume like i ran a marathon every continent and so it's like you start to stack these things and for me it's again learning why am i doing that it was a self defense a self defense mechanism to not get hurt if, if I'm attractive and fit and interesting and this and that and this and that, no one will ever hurt me and no one will ever leave me. So then you end up doing this with people. You keep people at arm's length. Um, and again, where does that stem from? My parents' divorce, my dad's addiction, my dad being unfaithful to my mom. Like, it's all there. You just have to be willing to unpack it and realize that those things have massive impact on us and do the work to say, okay, that's not going to serve me in my adult life. You know, how do I accept that those things happen? They impacted me and release them and let them go. So is that some of the work? You know, I'd love to hear more about some of the work that you do with people today of obviously having your own personal journey with disordered eating. And if and when people come to you, Nikki, and are like, this is where I am. This is everything about whatever. Like, where do you start with them? Great question. And one thing just to note, and for those of you listening, we all at some point go through our life thinking, you know, I'm alone. I'm the only person going through this. Or where does this stem from? And the cool thing to know is it's 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 both like a, a kind of curse and a blessing when you know it, but all the challenges that we face in adulthood start from when you are three months old to seven years old, because that's where your brain is developing that's where you form the sense of i the ego the identity and that's where you take all of these experiences and beliefs things you know watching your parents things like that mm -hmm. and it gets implanted into your subconscious mind now the subconscious mind is 95 percent of our brain so the subconscious mind is controlling all of our thoughts actions behaviors and so when people come to me a lot of them do come to my program because they want to lose weight say like, wonderful and I have no no issue with what like whatever your goal is. There's nothing wrong with it. 
But the first thing that we do, and so let me just also, share. Can I just say thank you for saying that because I we have gone so far on the other end with the body positivity movement that we can't talk about you know, other people can't. I do, but whether it's people's bodies, weight loss goals, and all of that stuff, and it's like, listen, some people want to lose weight and aren't happy with where their current weight is, and like that's okay to talk to talk about yeah. that. That person wants to make some changes just like any other changes you would want to make in your life. But we just went so far down. Oh. Just like, guys, <laughs> I, I work out to continue to stay strong. I want to, you know, improve performance in certain areas. And like, you know, we're, we all work out on some level addition to the mental health benefits to try to get some physical benefits. So totally. like, can we please- Can we just talk about it? I know. Talk? Yeah, it's well, and no, directly what's... crazy. What's funny, in 2017, my second book came out and it was called Meal Prep Your Way to Weight Loss. Now, the publishers had decided the title, I think maybe six months or so before. So I wrote the book. Mm-hmm. Did I mean, we kind of knew what it was going to be about. And then we solidified the title. And 2017 is in May when it came out is when the, you know, tides had changed. I think it was May. Anyways, it that year is when the whole movement, it was like, oh, no, magazines, so a lot of magazines yeah. wouldn't feature the book or me because they're like, oh, sorry, we can't talk about that. I'm like, um, so at the time, I'm like, what do you mean you can't talk? And now, like, I'm, vi- and so this is, hear me out for anyone listening, I'm actually very anti-body positivity for the specific reason of like, love your body, sure, 100%. But the moment that it becomes, in my eyes, my view and working with clients, the moment it becomes like, hey, I just love my body. I'm cool as is. Well, that means that you've just accepted where you are and you no longer want to grow. And if you no longer want to grow, that means that you're going to stay stagnant where you are. And if you're stagnant where you are, your life is not going to get better. It's like saying, hey, I want this thing, but I'm not going to do anything about it. I'm just going to sit here and I'm just going to accept, you know, this is how I look, which is great if that's what you want. But when nearly half of America is obese, Mm -hmm. right, nearly half of America, one in four kids now, and that's that number is rising. I mean, it's 41.9 percent during the pandemic was considered obese. That is an alarming number because it's not just about how you look at this point. It's about your health, your organs and the body positivity movement for me is like it's so focused on the how do I look? Great love your body if that's how you think you should look but like do you really want to not be able to be around for your kids do you really want to teach this message to your Mm -hmm. kids that like it's okay to not take care of yourself and so i come from the opposite end of like the super disordered eating i then did gain quite a bit of weight and i found that balance between the two but the thing that i found my clients love is that i challenge people on their beliefs like i have women who come in and they need to lose 80 pounds that's their number one goal and because they come to me i'm like great cool let's talk about that and i come with a place of total acceptance for whatever your goal is and then we work at what's the goal behind the goal well the goal behind the goal of losing 80 pounds and and i really do have a client who like that is her thing she's been binging nonstop since 2018 every single day since 2018. Mm. we've been working together for a month, for three weeks now, she has not binged. She has not had that since 2018. So, and she feels good in herself. She feels free. And so when we think about it, what's the goal behind the goal? And it really goes back to this. I want to be able to live life. I want to be able to enjoy life. Mm -hmm. When you're caught in the disordered eating, thinking about food, thinking what you can't eat, you know, not liking your body. Oh my God. It's so time consuming. It's, it's so, so time- energy consuming. It's, 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 it takes up so much of your time, energy, thoughts. It's crazy. It's crazy. And then you don't live life. So life is just like passing you by and suddenly you're like, wait, I just wasted like 10 years of my life doing what? Mm-hmm. And so this is where the body positivity thing for me kind of comes in is like, let's stop the conversation just about like, great, you're 600 pounds. You're happy with yourself. Okay. But how often are you like going out and legitimately being outside with friends? And how often are you sitting at home binging? Because a human body does not get to 300 pounds without Mm -hmm. overeating. It doesn't. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, I, you know, I, I agree. And I love what you said about what's the goal behind the goal, because all this stuff that we're doing is, is emotion driven. We are seeking some sort of emotion, whether it is love and acceptance of ourself. And I think that's what people say, oh, accept your body. I'm like, guys, not everybody has or wants to have the same body. I, I, I get it. And I'm not advocating for that, but there is, there is a, a barometer of health. But, and we know that when you're healthy and putting good food in your body and moving your body, you're going to feel good. And so instead of just accepting, you know, well, I'm never going to be healthy. So I'm going to learn to love my body. Like that's, that's a cop out. You, you can, you can make the decisions to be healthy. And my boyfriend and I just did this, you know, thing at Fountain Life where we went and got everything tested because we are on the outside really fit and we work out a lot and we eat the right things, but we just wanted to make sure you know, our brain health, our heart health, our gut health, everything was in line. And we're like, are there room for improvements? Because we both want to live a long, healthy life. And we want to, we want to get the information so that we can do that. It's really important to us. And yeah, Nikki, the stats sort of speak for themselves. And instead of just accepting, oh, 40 plus percent of the country is, you know, obese and what that does for, to the healthcare system and everything else. And happiness and quality of life like let's do something about it it's not just that's this is not this is not a place for us to just offer acceptance it's like nope we gotta make some changes totally and i you know i think also within the body positivity movement that i've seen is and it's so like it's counterintuitive as, as i say this but it's a lack of knowledge now there is so much knowledge out there so much you can learn if you want to go but just as you were saying with your family in minnesota i believe that's where where you uh, said north dakota north yeah. dakota close yeah, yeah. <laughs> the midwest right it, it, i have a lot of clients who are like I, they haven't felt good in so many years that they don't even know like the, my one client who hasn't been busy she doesn't even know like only only now after three weeks does she remember what it feels like but she knows it doesn't feel good what she's doing. She knows it doesn't feel good, but she forgot what it's like to trust her body. She forgot what it's like to trust her mind. She forgot what it's like to have energy, not be fatigued all day from, you know, thinking the stories, hiding things from her husband. And from all of that, it's kind of this like we have to provide information because the government sure AF is not going to. And we know that from the pandemic. We know that from if the food that we're eating is literally toxic. And like, this is a, a, a nice way that I I really changed my mindset about food was what if we started calling the current, like, quote unquote, food that we're eating, what if we called that toxic food? And the stuff we're supposed to be eating, what if we just called that food? So instead of saying, hey, do you want to go get a healthy meal tonight? We said, hey, do you want to go get a toxic burger tonight? That immediately is going to change your mindset. And just I like as that. Because when we say, hey, do you want to go get something healthy? It's like, eh, I, I mean, yeah, but like I also want a pizza. Come on. Versus if we change the labeling of it, because mm -hmm. that's what it is. The majority of the food that people eat in America is toxic from the chemicals to the calories, whatever you want to add to it. And so that's kind of like where it's so like mind blowing to me, where it's counterintuitive that we need to educate people. But really, we need to educate one about food and two about emotions, because if if someone is sitting there like, yeah, great, I'm like super happy about my body. We're all still looking for love and acceptance. So you've just found acceptance from others in another way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I like the. I mean, the same goes for alcohol, right? Where you're like, let's go grab a drink. Or if you're like, do you want to go grab some poison? <laughs> right. You'd be like, ah, uh, but the alcohol industry and the food industry have done the same thing. They have, there's so much money behind it and they market it as like joy. This makes your life better. Comfort food. Yeah. Um, all of these things that are, that make it feel like it's the right decision to make or nothing wrong with it. Live a little, you know, what's the big deal? Happy hour. All of these, the very, very smart marketing tricks yeah. and tools that have convinced us these things are not killing us. And while Americans are living longer, you know, from a lot of it is modern, you know, medicine and pills and medication, people are sicker. And, yeah. you quality know- of your life is down. Quality of life is down. And again, it's, it's you, you can't, 
quote unquote, have your cake and eat it too all the time. There's always a reason. It's always someone's birthday. There's always a happy hour. There's always going to be a rainy day. There's always going to be a sunny day. There's there's 52 Fridays. There's 52 Saturdays. Like you're going to get, you've, it's really easy to, if we start to play that game of how often we're making bad decisions that don't serve us in the long run. Um, my, my favorite one on that is I, and to be fair, like, so I, I still drink poison. I still drink alcohol, but I, I like the, the one of, I only drink on days that end with Y because mm. <laughs> it's like exactly what you're saying. And I love like when, you know, people are traveling, it's like, well, you know, it's, it's five o'clock somewhere, even though it's like six in the morning there and like, you know, you do you. And I think what we're in agreement and what I hear you saying is it's not like we're not saying cut the thing out entirely. Of course. It's it's finding a healthy moderation balance. Like I can go and eat pizza now like with so much joy, a burger. Like I love food. I have I have so much respect for food now because I've found joy with food and I didn't have that for so many years. Now I'm very aware and, and this is what I teach my clients the difference between a binge and a beautiful binge. Now, a beautiful binge is I've already pre-decided I'm going to. Like, you know what? It's it's just going to happen. I'm aware. So instead of, you know, the mm -hmm. blame, game, shame, whatever, like, oh, I shouldn't do this. It's like, okay, how about I accept that I'm going to? How about I accept myself that I'm going to? And from there, it becomes a mindfulness thing saying like, well, what do I really want? And I remember I had this during my journey and I was like, all right, I'm going to allow you the other thing's not working, telling yourself not to eat it. So what if I allowed myself to? And so I went and got the pizza, this amazing, you know, New York style pizza in LA. I re kind of heated it in the oven. I put it on a, a plate. I poured a glass of wine, lit some candles, put on a movie, used a knife and fork. And suddenly the binge became a beautiful binge. And I didn't feel guilty. I didn't even finish the last pizza pizza. I didn't feel like shit the next day. And mm -hmm. so it changed my whole mindset on, oh, interesting. And Nikki, the, I that is powerful. I have this 90-10 rule. Um, and it's not like there are some things I don't do, right? I don't smoke cigarettes. I just it's it's there are things I abstain from that don't serve me and I've never had to put them into my 10%. But it's exactly that. I have found when I am like, I am doing this tonight, I'm like, I want a burger. I want fries. And like you plan it instead of it like surprising you and you're like, Oh my god i just like have to do, and you eat it so fast all the thing. and you feel the shame and you're just like oh my gosh but exactly you get in you get in control of it so 90 10 is really an amazing rule that works for me because 10 percent nikki is three days a month so it's like that's a decent amount or you're like if you want the burger if you want a drink if you want these things that you know maybe don't serve you all the time and everybody's 90 10 is frankly different for what they may have issues with or the 10 percent that makes them feel not not great if they were doing it 40% of the time, but it's allowed me to like, there's not restriction there. I know I can have it. Some Sometimes it might end up being 15% like on a month and that's okay, but it just doesn't, it feels like I'm the one in control now instead of the other way around where a craving would come and it'd be like, oh my God, I never do this. So I'm gonna eat the whole thing of ice cream, right. you know, and then I spend the next several days, you know, shaming myself or, you know, worse back in my twenties would go throw it up. Yeah. I, and I think it's so the 90, 10, 80, 20, like whatever works for you. The way that I have really focused my life on things is does, and this is what I do with my clients. So that the four month program that I have, like I, I'll tell you this story really quickly because it's, it's the power of what I went through and I've learned, I now get to help other people to overcome their stuff. So I was working with this one client who she purged five times a day and she was in the Navy in Guam with her husband five times a day. She'd seen eating disorder specialist therapists and just nothing was moving the mark. We worked together and within one month, she never part. She's she completely stopped just as my one client has stopped uh, binging for three weeks thus far. And <clears throat> it's been five five plus years since we worked together. And I, I will periodically get emails from her from that one month. She's never perched another day in her life. Mm -hmm. And so the work that I yeah. So what was it? What do you think helped her? That was well, it's 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 the program that I do of getting into the subconscious mind to 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 change the the beliefs and create new neural pathways. And so mm -hmm. the the neural pathways that we have in 
in the mind, as I said, are created from three to seven. And so when when we have those and all of these experiences, beliefs, thoughts, patterns, they go in the mind. And according to NASA research, when when we do something consistently for 30 days, it becomes a neuro pathway, meaning it forms a behavior, a pattern, a habit. Mm -hmm. You can change anything in 30 days, according to NASA. And so <clears throat> it's just with the program that I have of one, looking at your fears, kind of like therapy. Two, it's a tremendous amount of support. Three, there's you're you're kind of going backwards to look at, you know, what are the catalysts, what are the causes, the triggers, and also crowding in a lot of different exercises of forgiveness, inner child work, all of these different yeah. things. And so, I mean, that's why I love this program because women just completely, tra literally, it's called the Ultimate Transformation Program, and they completely transform in four months from issues that they have dealt with their whole life. And so, you know, going through through all of this and like with my own journey and what you were just saying about like the 80, 80, 20, 90, 10, or the 90, 10, mm -hmm. I was saying 80, 20, is one of the big things I teach and I live my life by is this meal. Like how many times have you eaten a healthy meal, but you just ate too much of it? Because I used to do that too. Mm -hmm. I, it was healthy, but then it was just too much food. So now I ask myself, one, will this bring me joy now? Oftentimes a pizza is yes. Two, will this bring me joy in an hour? Oh, interesting. Now I'm starting to think about later. Then the other thing is, will this meal make me feel light and energetic or heavy and full? And so those are just things that I kind of naturally check in on. And I'm like, I can always tell if a binge, I'm not going to feel joyful. So now I'm, I'm able to just check in and like, do I still want to make it a beautiful binge? Yeah, I do. Okay, great. And the because I practice this so often, how do I want to feel? I want to feel energetic. I want to feel light and energetic. That makes me feel good. And so I'm I'm really basing things on how my body feels, not how it looks. And then the the reaction of that is because I'm treating it better based on how I feel. My body looks better than it ever has. And I don't like. I don't weigh myself. I don't look. I'm like, oh my God, I have a six pack of abs. I like work out less. I eat more quote unquote unhealthy foods all because I'm just consistently checking in with myself. And that's one of the the biggest shifts that happened, at least in my my journey to get to here. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's awesome. So where where can people learn more about this, Nikki? Because as you said, there's so many of us uh, who, whether or not we can classify and say we've had an eating disorder don't have a healthy relationship with food, find themselves spending too much time and energy thinking about what to eat, what not to eat, um, and and having it control a lot of the decisions um, we're making. So where do people find out more about the program if they're interested? And could you talk to us a little bit about like who's an ideal candidate for this? Sure. I mean, you, you can find it everything at my website, NikkiSharp.com or Instagram, and you can always message me to see if it's the right fit for you. Um, you know, who's the ideal candidate? It's someone who's ready to take responsibility of their life. I do have people that come in and they're like, all right, I want changes. And then mm -hmm. the moment that faced with, oh, but actually I don't want to take responsibility for my behaviors or actions, it, it, the program just it won't work for you. So it's it's those who are ready for change, like those who are tired of feeling low energy or mm -hmm. unhappy about their body, those who like I have a lot of people who come in for career related reason. They they want to make more money, but they don't know what to do or they're stepping out of their career. I have people come in who are trying to find their soulmate and they're like, I don't understand why I can't find my person. So the program helps with all different aspects because it goes over everything in your life, which is why it's mm. the ultimate transformation program. And it's it's basically everything that I've learned over the course of my journey that I'm just ridiculously passionate but just as you yeah. like uh, we get to teach the thing that we're passionate about and helping other people and it's really what I've learned is I had to go through everything I did in order to teach what I do to help other people what well, makes you credible you know like people let but people respond to that and want to know great that there's somebody here who's gone what I've who's been been through what I'm going through and that can be really um comforting for folks a hundred percent uh, amazing. Well, so my last, I always ask people one of five questions that I have, and I seem to be defaulting to the same one because I think it's fascinating for people to hear different answers. 
And so success for us changes as we go through our different points in our life. But for you, Nikki, today, like what defines a successful day for you today? A successful day is one where I feel joyful, where joy is really the the present thing, the present emotion. Um, it's one where I felt like I I spent time slowing down because I I know a lot of people do, but I have a tendency to push myself more and more and do more and go more and the to do list. And so it's actually slowing down. So I have a rule that after every interview or you know podcast I'm doing or client call, I go sit on the bed and I just chill out for a few minutes. So I calm yeah. the nervous system. So what you know, successful day is really like have I progressed forward in something that I was trying to do? Mm -hmm. Why is that? It doesn't mean that I needed to get there, but just have I progressed in something a little bit? Did I feel joyful about something? Did I overcome a challenge? Like I've set myself up for success on how to have a good day and how to feel successful that like doing this interview, I'm going to go to bed tonight and be like, damn, that was a good day. So yeah. that to me looks like success where it's really like, what am I doing that's bringing me joy so mm -hmm. that it's not just like the one thing, did I exercise or did I do this? Or it's like, did I move the needle somewhere in my life to feel better? Yeah, I, I think that that's great. And that's the thing that I love about the answers from people is those things are different for everybody. And figuring out what makes you feel successful when you can put your head on the pillow at night is really, and again, it changes throughout different chapters and eras of our life, depending on what's going on and priorities and you know, paying attention to that and make sure you're following through and spending your time in that way. Um, What's so your answer? Oh, gosh, my answer is, uh, you know, I feel like I'm having this massive shift and I feel like we could talk uh, for hours about this, too. But I know that you recently married. Um, I've I've for a long time, like lived in my masculine energy because I'm an entrepreneur and, you know, mm -hmm. I feel like that's and I spent a lot of time and really pushed energy into it. And I'm finally in my feminine and I, I feel myself when I have to step into my masculine. I'm like, this is so unnatural. Yes. For me now. Yeah. So a big part of me feeling successful um, now is how am I doing in my feminine? Um, I'm in a, this amazing relationship where I finally feel like that individual gets to come out because of his masculine energy. And that's really rewarding for me. And um, so there's that piece of it. And yeah, for me, it is, did I move my body today? Um, did I contribute to somebody's life in a way that was impactful? Was I a good person? You know, did I do something that I need to apologize for that I didn't apologize for? So it's just like taking those little stock things in my head of, was I proud of the person that I was today? Yeah. Um, and, you know, did I behave in the way that, you know, if someone had a camera on me all day, I'd be proud of. I love that. And I mean, God, I would love to spend two more hours with the masculine because that's my thing too is that like residing in my masculine might and I think a lot of that yeah. is the eating disorder and the control and but exactly the same thing of being in my masculine and so when I say like joy and I go to my bed and I just like lay down that's me tapping into that feminine energy because if I don't I like you boom I'm in that masculine right. energy and that affects my relationship right but avoid it. and and it's like it is a conscious choice just as choosing what to eat is. It is a conscious choice if I'm going to be in my masculine or feminine today. Right. It's just totally, totally right. something new. And for for women out there, you can take it from Nikki and I, like I just sort of always thought I needed someone to accept my masculine. And I was like, oh, maybe I should take responsibility that I need to create space for someone to show up in the way that I want him to. And, and if he does that, then I will feel comfortable being in my in my feminine and um it's been like truly transformational for me even so like he's working out there and when we work and if i'm on a call and i have to get whatever i'm like i hate that he can even hear that side of me it's like this is not who i want to be uh and so i'm i'm putting things in place with my new company already to ensure that like i don't want to be on these phone calls i want to make sure this is set to go and someone else can handle this um because if I can feel that version of myself having to come forth. And like, I'm, she's, she's led the show. That masculine version of Anne has been front and center for 15 years. And it's time for her to like take a break. Yeah. Oh, I love that. What a 
great answer. Thank you for sharing. Oh, thanks. Well, I will see you in April. I'm so I can't excited. wait. I know. Yeah. And I, I was speaking with uh, Dr. Wood as well, and and I'm like, I'm sitting in. So I'm I'm teaching two workshops there, but I'm like, I'm sitting in on everyone's sessions as well. Like I'm there to learn. I'm yeah. I'm there to learn and me, grow. Me and yeah, it's gonna be it's gonna be great. So for those of you um, who do not know, Nikki and I are joining Jamie Hess in what, April twenty third. Is April twenty third? Yep, yeah. Yeah, 23rd. I don't know if it's going to be sold out by the time you hear this, but uh, it's called You're Not Broken. Um, you can check it out on, you know, just Google it um, or go to their Nick Eira's Instagram um, and check out more information about it. But we're all going to be together helping people realize how strong and empowered they actually are. Yes. Can't wait. Well, thanks for joining, Nikki. Really appreciate the time, energy, and all of the advice and sharing so many personal things about your own journey. I know sometimes that can be Super vulnerable thing to do, but I appreciate you doing that so it can help other other people. So welcome and thank you for having me on. Thanks. Thanks, Nikki.